Good afternoon, everyone. We are delighted to be joined by David Pearson um, for a Q&A following on from the Resilient Management Initiative of which um, David was a part. Um, from, um, we received a number of questions from our audience about David's presentation, and so we're going to um, talk through them this afternoon. But before we begin, um, David, if you wouldn't mind just um, introducing yourself a little bit um, for the benefit of everyone, please. Great. Many thanks, Grace. Um, hello, everyone. Again, it's a pleasure to be part of this initiative. Um, thank you to Dodds um, and to Grace for creating this and um, curating it and inviting me to be part of it. Um, for those who may not have seen any of the previous um, videos of the interview and the Q&A session, um, I've been uh, some years ago, I was appointed global head, uh, global director of inclusion and diversity at KPMG, um, and that came with a remit of uh, inclusion and diversity for 200,000 people in 154 countries. Um, I'm currently undertaking some really interesting research in the area of inclusion and leadership. Um, so I'm to be delighted to uh, be with you again today. Wonderful. Thank you very much, David. Um, and also thank you to our um, three contributors who submitted questions, Damien, Roland and Adrian. Um, we hope that, um, well, thank you for submitting the questions and thank you to David for uh, providing the answers. Um, and so the first one that we have um, is around cultures across the globe. So as you mentioned, David, you've previously been responsible for um, inclusion and diversity for um, employees across the globe um, and this question is around um, while we're in lockdown and different um, or different countries will be coming out at different stages how can leaders ensure that all employees um, feel as though they're being treated equally and that com company culture um, remains consistent during this time um, thanks Grace and, and thanks for this question it's a very wise question um, because it recognizes that many organizations make these grand promises about the way their employees will be treated in very different parts of the world. Um, but sometimes there is a lack of follow through on this, you know, to test whether this happens in practice. And that kind of follow through is really spoken about. And it's really considered when leaders in an organization gather together and, you know, talk about this ideal world they wish to create. And, and as pointed out in the question at the moment, you know, um, different parts of the world are going to look very different as things open up at different times. There'll be some people working remotely for a very long period of time to come. Some may be able to get back into the office. Some, you know, people's home and social lives will be in very different states. And so I think my response is that in some ways, we firstly need to acknowledge it's, it's impossible for companies to create the same experience of belonging in all the places they operate. And, and this is partly because the external circumstances in some parts of the world um, are so challenging, or even in some cases antithetical to belonging for some people, that even the most powerful employer in the world will struggle to overcome those kinds of external factors. And you can see how, how much of a trap it is for leaders to promise, oh, you know, everyone will be treated equally, our culture will be the same everywhere. Um, not just because of lockdown, but even, you know, if you, if you think about people's working lives normally. And so I think we, we've got to be really careful here. Just think about maybe um, places where the legal, political and social systems are actually systematically geared against certain classes of people. Um, it can be hugely challenging then to apply this notion that our employees are all treated the same wherever they are in the world. I mean, you know, one example we often see is um, in relation to things like sexual orientation. You know, we know that LGBT plus people are working in extremely hostile environments in some parts of the world. And we immediately think of things like the physical safety of employees, you know, quite rightly. But we sometimes forget about some of the other factors. Um, I don't know, think of something like the tax situation. What if the employee has a same sex partner? and the home country or the global treatment of tax recognises that relationship, but the local tax regime doesn't. Um, what about data and privacy issues? Does the employee have to report their marital status to the local tax authorities? Um, is, can their spouse even join them if they're posted somewhere as an expat? Or what if they're a local employee? You know, can their firm truly recognise same-sex benefits for their partner if the legal regime doesn't allow this? And you think about the fact people are now perhaps working from home, 
What additional security and privacy issues are there for people in some parts of the world where, you know, they're having to, in effect, put part of their life online? And we've all seen that and laughed at those videos where, you know, someone's recording at home or they're in a, a video conference and um, their child walks in or an animal walks in, you know, the dog starts barking. That's all great and fun. But what if something happens that actually compromises the safety of someone? you know, who's in one of these situations. So I, th I think leaders need to be extremely wary of sitting on a stage and proclaiming that every one of their employees is treated the same everywhere in the world. Um, I've heard too often from people that this simply is not the case. And it actually er erodes employee trust when leaders make these declarations and then fail to back them up. Um, so with the added complexity of lockdown and COVID, I think leaders have got to be even more careful at making those statements. I think also, we should be honest with ourselves and recognise that organisations themselves play a role in perpetuating some of the systems they say they disagree with. You know, imagine proclaiming that you treat all employees equally regardless of race or colour. We're in the world perpetuating a system where white people get promoted ahead of everyone else, receive better performance ratings, higher pay, stay in the firm longer, it then that makes the mockery of the idea that the employer treats everyone equally around the world because it's not even treating everyone in one country or location, is it? You're saying one thing about what you're doing around the world and you're doing something different internally. So I think in a way we need to turn things on their head a bit. We'll treat people, but about what the employees actually experience. What is their lived experience like that leaders make? Does it live up to the hype um, coming out of, you know, corporate comms or marketing team? And if people in some parts of the world are in lockdown for longer, their lived experience is going to be quite different from their colleagues, isn't it? So it's actually going to um, highlight and exacerbate those differences. So I think it's one of the biggest traps for leaders, actually, that I've seen in my several decades of working on leadership and more recently working, focusing on inclusion and diversity. This way that leaders are immediately drawn to start thinking about what they and the organisation should do to fix things, right? It's a natural. They sit in a room with a group of bright people and all the senior people fill the airwaves and they stamp their influence all over everything and they shade, shade out anyone with an unconventional perspective. And so a solution is created and it's kind of mapped out into a plan and then it's sent off for implementation. And the whole thing is the wrong way around. The organisation tries to apply this approach of equal treatment through, you know, to all people through policy, through procedure and all sorts of initiatives and interventions. But there's often two crucial ingredients missing. Firstly, um, a genuine, deep, and sometimes discomforting input from the actual people affected, from the employees. And secondly, as I mentioned at the beginning, any follow through, any accountability, measurement or real change in progress, evaluation, re-evaluation and adjustment, those things are often missing. So I guess closing out, you know, it, it's a simple act of logic to understand that doing the same things in very different locations and contexts will not and cannot produce the same results, can it? So just think about it. If, if I say I'm going to give all of my employees SPF 15 sunscreen in any part of the world they're in because we want to treat everyone equally, mm -hmm. then people in hot, sunny locations are going to burn, aren't they? Those in, in the middle of the Arctic in winter, you know, don't have any use for that. So, or if I say, imagine, you know, every office is going to get the same heating and cooling system regardless of where you are in the world, because we treat everyone equally. Well, that means people in the tropics are probably going to end up with a useless heating system and inadequate air conditioning. And then people working in cold places are going to get the opposite. So can you see how senseless it is to say, oh, we've got the same policies and procedures in place for everyone. <laughs> That's helpful for equality and for equity. And it looks good. It sounds great. Um, but it doesn't stand up to scrutiny and it completely ignores the hugely different contexts and lived experiences of employees all around the world. Um, it's why a policy that seeks to produce better outcomes might work well in one country and be nearly useless in another. Mm -hmm. Global policies and procedures are all safe. They're not well thought through for purpose, but they keep the lawyers happy. Um, I'm just wondering if briefly it would be helpful to give a real life example, because I'm conscious I'm talking quite a lot at a fairly high level, but I was actually involved in creating um, the resources for a Speak Up campaign. 
And the idea was for, you know, to empower all the employees to speak up if they felt someone's behavior was inappropriate or maybe making them uncomfortable. Um, but the way everything was written, the language that was used, and the whole way the campaign was designed and executed completely ignored the fact that for, for example, a white middle manager who was male, speaking up is a completely different experience from something that a junior member of staff would be asked to do, or perhaps someone who's BAME or female. You know, you just can't compare the two things. And yet all, all the processes and language assumed that everyone was equal and everyone was being provided with the same opportunity to speak up. Mm -hmm. But it's simply not true. So I, I think employers would be better to be honest and just say, look, the principle is that everyone is treated the same in the world, wherever you are. But the reality is that the concepts of you, you know, we as an employer make a commitment to work within the current constraints to understand and improve every employee's actual experience of the workplace and also to work for change in the long term so that those, those inequalities are ironed out over time. Because you can imagine if an organisation is purely addressing what it can do to optimise things for employees as things currently stand mm -hmm. and completely ignore any opportunities to change the whole system for the better over time. I think an employer is abdicating, you know, both the responsibility to do so and the fact that it's got the means to make a difference. Mm -hmm. So recapping, employers promise that they do certain things, that they say everyone is treated equally everywhere in the world, but they tend to ignore the actual experience of employees and they start to believe their own PR. They rely too much on universal policies and procedures instead of understanding and responding to what employees actually experience and they focus too much on providing short-term quality of action and ignoring the long-term change to the systems and structures in society and within the organisation itself that perpetuate those inequalities and reinforce existing privileges. We can see this debate playing out right now, can't we, in very distressing circumstances around race and colour, but it's there in all the other dimensions of diversity too. I know that was a bit of a rant, but it personally gets to me when leaders spout off about how globally inclusive they are without really having any insight into what that means. It's an irresponsible and inauthentic thing for a leader to do. I'd rather they were honest and say, it's a really hard challenge and I struggle with it. Super stuff. Thank you, David. Um, and the next question um, that I have for you is um, also related to cultural intelligence in the time of um, COVID lockdowns. And um, this is around um, diversity inclusion initiatives, which can have um, a positive benefit for everyone involved. So um, perhaps as an example, improving facilities and equipment to help facilitate staff with a disability, which also in turn um, benefits other staff members also. So the question is around how can leaders use their cultural intelligence to identify and prioritise initiatives like this? Well, I, I truly love this question because one of the ways forward that I think we really need to latch on to um, to help us navigate these challenging times um, is, you know, because it's, it's very easy to get drawn into the drama and the negative issues, isn't it? Um, and the images that we see all the time, it can feel quite overwhelming. And, you know, uh, maybe for a more junior employee, it, they might feel helpless, they might feel disconnection during this time. But, you know, leaders can also feel overwhelmed because they have a responsibility to do something. You know, they feel responsible to do, they do nothing. So I, I really like the opportunity this question gives us to explore the idea leaders are already doing things they can build from and they already have many of the skills and inclusion. This is a really positive thing to keep in mind. I also love the way the question mentioned um, much of what we do to support particular groups of people also improves things for everyone. You know, when we install a ramp with stairs, um, along with the stairs, say, we help people uh, with disabilities, but we also help pregnant women. We have people who've just had surgery. I don't know, people carrying bulky items, people who need to deliver something on a trolley, people who are just tired and they'd rather walk up a ramp than the stairs. You know, the list goes on. And so by analogy, just about every workplace initiative you can think of that was originally designed to address the needs of one group actually turns out to offer collateral benefits, if you like. Um, to just about everyone. I mean, I made that up then, collateral benefits. Don't know what that is exactly, but you know what I'm saying. I mean, think of, think of flexible working. 
Um, maybe that was designed for working mothers, but it provides an obvious benefit to any employee who, say, is a carer of any sort um, or anyone who needs flexibility for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So, yes, employers are starting to look more closely now at the home working environment because of COVID. Um, and there's lots of subtle nuances coming up, you know, like lack of privacy, um, ergonomics, as was mentioned, but even things like lack of internet facilities. You know, a lot of um, employees don't even have access to internet at home or it's, you know, not strong enough to, to host um, and take part in video conferencing, for example. So there will need to be an overhaul of pay, um, provisions, welfare support, the way we support our employees, tax treatment, you know, many other areas to recognise that we're likely to see a long-term and permanent shift to remote working, whether that's at home, whether it's in office hubs. So I think one way leaders can build on the good initiatives already being done um, and to harness this kind of concept of cultural intelligence is actually with the peak bodies and other well-informed organisations that have been treading this path for a while. And I guess three in particular come to mind from areas um, one focuses on disability, one around trans inclusion, and then one works across the whole spectrum of inclusion. So, um, you may have heard of the, Di the Business Disability Forum based here in the UK. Um, it has a global task force, which I was appointed to a few years ago. Um, and they have an excellent resources and a really well documented and systematic approach to creating inclusion for people with disabilities all around the world. Do this by bringing together experts um, from a wide range of sects. Um, they include disability practitioners, um, employee organisations, you know, employers from every sector you can think of. And it's definitely worth getting in touch with them to see some of the innovative approaches they have been working on for the last few, few years that will help all of us, frankly. You know, a couple of years ago, I um, broke my finger. Um, long story, someone accidentally kicked me at a Christmas party, it snapped my finger. And I couldn't type properly for quite a while and I needed some support and I was able to get hold of some software that allowed me to dictate into my computer and it would then type for me. And, you know, so my disability was short term, but I suddenly realised, well, actually, you know, these resources are here. They're not just for people who consider themselves to have a long term disability. And I think having the cultural intelligence to understand that disability is one thing, but actually the benefits you bring from workplace adjustments help a whole range of people. Mm -hmm. And then thinking, well, okay, how can I support my people in this time? Uh, is there software available that would make working from home easier for people? Even if it's something as simple as a little reminder every 20 minutes to take a break, you know, to, to have a, um, to look away from your laptop. So then if we think about trans inclusion, um, you may have heard of Global Butterflies. Um, it's a, uh, organization it's run by Rachel Reese and she works with Emma Cusden um, providing expert advice on trans inclusion in a global context and you know Global Butterflies um, provides leaders with really practical and robust advice um, and insights about how to make a difference and men's women you know Rachel and Emma are authentic leaders in this area. You know, they know what it feels like to experience the things that they describe and they know what works well, what doesn't work so well when it comes to supporting trans colleagues and making workplaces attractive as places where trans people would want to work. So again, you know, there are some specific challenges that trans people face during this time of lockdown. And um, I may talk a, a little bit about those later as well. And then lastly, you know, look, there's lots of organisations working in multiple dimensions of diversity. Um, I mean, Dodds itself, you know, you, you offer amazing sessions uh, across a whole spectrum of things with really good speakers who've got, you know, expert background. So I would recommend Dodds. But, but then if I also mention perhaps um, e and i who some of you may have come across, and I know in particular, I've done a bit of work with Adrian Horolan and Trett. Um, he works with his colleagues in leveraging the work that e and i does and has done over the years into a global context. So my recommendations here are really practical ones. They go to the experts. If you're a leader and you want to use your cultural intelligence, one of the best ways to do that is to harness those people who are experts in those cultures and to say, what is it I can do that I'm doing already? And what can I build on to get, create more inclusion for those groups that will then benefit everyone in the workplace? Wonderful stuff. 
Thank you, David. So the next question um, is around, it picks up on your first presentation and your mention about um, workplace sometimes being like factories where there are lots of processes and policies and procedures. Um, but what this question relates to is the fact that now that we are outside of the actual physical workplace in many cases and that we are all working from home, um, how um, how do we know which of these processes and policies and procedures really are relevant or helpful? And um, how can leaders know what's expected of them so that they can know um, what it is that is helpful for them to be good at um, and what they can work on um, to better prepare them for the future? Um, and if it's even possible to know that yet. Great, thanks Grace. Well, you know, this is one of the most difficult questions I think I've been asked. Um, but I love difficult questions, so that's good. Um, maybe just to recap for anyone who may not have heard in full the part where I talked about workplaces as factories in um, my original interview uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, what I was saying really was that in some ways workplaces are factories or like factories because they have these processes in place um, to make up for poor leadership. I mean, generally speaking, the factory will keep on producing even if one of its leaders makes bad decisions, right? So you can kind of get away with being a pretty poor leader in an organisation when things are operating normally. If you fall down as a leader, um, there will be compensatory mechanisms in place to cope with that, at least to some degree. Mm -hmm. So I guess this takes us to the question of what leaders should um, and shouldn't be doing in order to keep our factories going during times of disruption. You know, can we just rely on the system to keep things going you know, even if our leaders find themselves out of their depth and struggling, and, and if those processes and policies you talked about, Grace, you know, are no longer fit for purpose. I think we have to recognise that our current model trains leaders to lead um, in the context of a reasonably stable, reasonably predictable set of variables. I mean, yes, I know we, we always say the world's changing fast, the pace of change has never been so great and so on, but, you know, people have been saying that since the time of the ancient Greeks and earlier. Yeah. Um, but for some people, it really does feel like the world we're in now and the world we are going to be living into in the future are somehow an order of magnitude different from anything we've experienced before. You know, when we really believe that, we really feel that in ourselves, the whole hour discussing whether this is real or not, whether change really is at a pace that's different from it ever, but, you know, that's for another day. So instead, I would say there's probably two key questions to focus on, and they are, you know, how can leaders know what's expected of them and how can leaders know what they need to be good at? And to start with that first question, you know, how do you know what's expected of you as a leader? I'd say maybe a bit provocatively that the best way for a leader to know what is expected of them is to create what is expected of them, yeah, to be in charge of creating that, to fashion it for themselves from speaking to the people in their teams, um, to their colleagues, their stakeholders, um, and by understanding themselves better as leaders. I, I think, therefore, it should be an act of creation, not an act of receiving. Now, Yes, they could ask what's expected of them, but the people they're going to ask are usually themselves leaders too, right? Um, and so they're going to be part of a long chain of people looking to the people above for guidance. And then who sits above the person or the people at the top? I mean, the ceiling, uh, the sky, the shareholders, the board, the regulator, the government, the customer, I mean, who knows? I think that idea of a long chain of people all telling, you know, the people below them what's expected of them actually fills me with dread. And um, I think it plays right into one of the major flaws in the way we evaluate the performance of our leaders and the way we develop them, which is this weirdly, you know, hierarchical thing we borrowed from the military. Um, I mean, it works really well in the army, in the Navy, in the Air Force because of the context they operate in, but I think it makes a mess of the workplace. So instead, I would challenge leaders to look within themselves to look um, and feel what they feel, look outwards as well to the context they operate in, interrogate their environment, and be very intentional about articulating what is expected of them to those above them and those they lead, um, using their own words, taking responsibility and accountability, being humble. I think what is expected will be powerful if it's expressed not just as a list of achievements, or actions for the leader to do, or outcomes for the leader to achieve. If a leader can express that, they're going to be 
and not just borrow the words that are downloaded in the you know performance management system for their goals if a leader can express what is expected of them during and beyond times of uncertainty you know such as we live in now in the form of ways of being i think they lock unlock something very powerful you know we've had enough um of doing We've had enough of following procedures to keep the factory clunking away. I think it's time for leaders to step out of the hierarchy, to mm -hmm. stop relying on, on their formal power, their organisational power, and to be driven by their personal and loving power from the heart, not just from the head. Mm -hmm. And so in some way, I think this approach to the first question will actually help with the second question, which is, you know, how can leaders know what they need to be good at, especially in the future when things you know, could be very different and they might require very different skills. So to that, I would say it will change, much will stay the same. And again, we're getting a very deep philosophical issue here. You could argue that nothing will actually change at a fundamental level. We're going to be driven by deep desires, fears and values. Um, and the leader who can connect with us and support us the best we can be will be doing exactly what they need to be good at. But I know that's very not, uh, it's not really very concrete, is it, right? So I'd say there's as many approaches to knowing what we as leaders need to be good at now and in the future as there are individual leaders and the circumstances in which they lead. But for those who'd like somewhere to start, um, why not consider putting yourself in the shoes of the people you lead? Ask yourself what they might be experiencing right now and what things might feel like for them in the weeks, the months and the years ahead. Of course, no one's got a crystal ball, right? So none of us knows what the workplace is going to be like in five years or how it will differ in different parts of the world. But actually, we don't need to know that. We have all the information we need right now in front of us and it comes with us into the future. We have that information in our teams, our colleagues, the people we lead, our stakeholders. Talk to them. Have casual but intentional conversations with them about how they feel, um, what they experience, what would make a difference for them and also undertake personal self-development ideally with a trusted guide or a coach you know and then be guided by all of those people and by what you feel in your heart as a leader and from these things patterns will emerge and they will come out of this clarity for you around what you need to be good at what skills you need to cultivate as a leader wonderful thank you david um, and the next two questions actually tap into what you've just been speaking about really quite nicely in that they both relate to um, the love audit that you also mentioned um, in the previous presentation. So the first question around that is um, around what leaders can do to make people feel that there is love in the workplace um, and how they'll be able to demonstrate that as people work from home. Well, I love this question because you know, move from good into um, from talk into action and making a difference in the real world. Um, you know, it's easy to sit up later, but you know, we also need to understand how to make them work. Well, again, there are people willing to ask it of themselves. Um, everyone has a different way of fostering a feeling of love and belonging. And one way maybe to approach this at this great un uncertainty and unrest is to challenge people to go beyond the ordinary here, beyond the everyday. So sure, we can do some of the ordinary things that demonstrate empathy and that help others feel that they belong. You know, there's obvious ones like with people one-on-one -on -one to see how they're feeling. Um, having some team rules about how online meetings are run, you know, to make sure everyone's voice is heard. They're all great things, but maybe we can challenge ourselves to go beyond the ordinary here. And what I have in mind was sparked actually by something one of my fellow panelists said on our recent Q&A. You might remember, um, she mentioned about how some trans people may be particularly affected by lockdown because they don't currently have access to some of the amenities they rely on to present the way they wish to at work. You know, imagine being on a video call with colleagues um, or clients, you know, um, from within lockdown when you've not been able to access treatments or medications that assist you with the way you look or the way you sound. Can you imagine the impact on that person's self-confidence, um, their sense of safety, their sense of belonging? So a leader who has awareness of such profound nuances, I think, is already well equipped 
to foster and demonstrate love to colleagues. But the thing to notice here is not that the leader is so much doing something for the other person, although obviously they are doing that if they are showing that awareness and, and that empathy. But what they're doing is, is something themselves. As a leader, they are thinking deeply about what do I need to know as a leader and who, who do I need to be in order to create that love and belonging? And, you know, it's easy to bring up a, some of these topics when, when we're in a sort of relatively safe environment, but is it easy to bring a, a topic like that up with a trans colleague? Is it easy when the trans person isn't actually open about being trans? Or, you know, the circumstances of lockdown may mean that you as a leader know that that person looks and sounds different and perhaps you're thinking, well, maybe this person is trans, but how do I raise such a sensitive topic without offending or making someone uncomfortable? Well, acting from love, it requires huge sensitivity. Um, it requires humility. It requires a willingness to get it wrong, to apologise if that happens and to move on. Mm -hmm. Seek advice from trans people who are open about tra being trans. You know, educate yourself, read, ask questions, become informed. Be aware of the nuances and the differences of opinion and approach among the community of trans people. Don't just follow simplistic solutions or turn straight to, you know, answers from policy. It's about taking responsibility as a leader for an act of love and being at peace with the consequences, whatever they are. If you're acting from the heart, the rest will follow. Um, and I think, you know, from this great example of supporting a trans person that, that was mentioned on that q and I think leaders can build out with other scenarios. Um, think about a scenario of an employee whose behaviour and maybe physical appearance suggests that there could be domestic abuse happening during lockdown. What do you do as a leader? How do you find out what's going on? How do you offer help? Or think about a colleague whose mental health appears to be deteriorating and who's resisting any attempts you've made to provide support. And we had some excellent advice last time on, you know, from Emma, from Mind, on what to do to support mental health of our colleagues. But what do you do next? How do you provide reassurance? How do you evaluate risks when you are remote from that person? And then maybe also think about a scenario like, um, I don't know, a new joiner who's never quite had time to settle into the team and seems to be acting withdrawn and is, is very passive. You know, is it because they're BAME? Is that why they feel they don't belong? You know, how do you understand what they're experiencing when you're white and when you are senior? You know, how can you check whether they feel excluded because of race when the rest of the team looks so different from them? Mm -hmm. So in all cases, um, I think love can be turned into action by asking ourselves who we would need to be in order for that person to feel love, to feel belonging. By asking ourselves, you know, what we could do in the name of love to create that love and belonging for that other person. Um, by being honest with ourselves and others, we may not get things right, but we're taking a stand for love and we're willing to be vulnerable because we want to foster belonging. And once we've acted in love in one thing, we can build out to the next thing, like moving on, you know, stepping stones across a pond. And each act of love and inclusion builds our own depth, our own resilience. And then we're practicing new skills, the skills of loving leadership. So I guess what we want is perhaps looking for ways to change ourselves and our perceptions our understanding and who we are being and then seeking to make that a reality for others through the questions we ask and the understanding we demonstrate and this is a much more profound approach isn't it and it, it does carry risk there is a possibility we as leaders will get this wrong we may make mistakes we may say or do the wrong thing but it's our vulnerability in being prepared to take the risk to make a difference in who we are being which is one of the most powerful ways we can create connection and foster love and belonging in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you, David. Um, and uh, the final question um, complements that really quite well in that um, an idea that you put forward also in your, um, in your previous presentation was around um, the idea of a love audit in an office or in a workplace. Um, and what this question asks is, um, could you expand a little bit more about what a love audit would look like and what it might do? Um, and how would an organisation go about trying to conduct such an audit? 
Um, thanks, Grace. So look, I, I may be wrong, but I believe I'm actually the person who invented the concept of the love audit. Um, at least I've never seen anyone else talk about it. So at least in a workplace setting anyway. Um, so you can blame me if you find this concept a bit strange. Um, but thank you for the question, because, you know, it's easy for me to coin a phrase um, or come up with a new concept. But asking me how it would work in practice gives me the opportunity to back my words up with something, you know, that can make a difference in the real world. So I guess the idea um, here is that, you know, for some weird reason, the word love seems to be taboo in the workplace. I mean, other than in its trivial meanings, you know, oh, I love tennis, I, I love this, that, the other, whatever, I love my dog. Um, or, you know, I, I, I love the, um, the menu on offer in the canteen today. But we use lots of fig leaf words in the workplace, don't we? Like, you know, empathy, uh, compassion, care, but it's very rare for leaders and colleagues to talk about love. In, in its fully powerful meaning in the workplace, particularly in a global context where, you know, often cultural differences uh, or our perception of cultural difference causes us to stamp out anything that might be considered an idiosyncrasy, right? And we, you know, we don't want to make anyone uncomfortable. So, of course, at the moment, we're not even sure what the workplace is. Like you said at the beginning, Grace, you know, um, for many people, the workplace in the coming weeks and months will be a very different proposition. For some, it's physical office space. For others, it's not. It's still being at home. So, you know, at the moment, we mostly see each other at the end of a screen. Um, so how do you even talk about and, and act with love on a video call? So I think the idea is for organisations to harness the force of the most powerful thing in the world we know of that creates belonging and inclusion. It's that love we experience in our mother's arms as babies. And that's the kind of taboo love we're talking about that usually isn't allowed through the doors of the workplace into the office. Now, we're quite used to the idea of doing audits, aren't we? You know, I mean, many people work um, or have work for auditors or other big organisations that carry out all sorts of audits. Um, so we're sort of familiar with the idea of checking the state of something to see if it complies with what we expect to see. And I think a love audit is a similar concept, but it involves checking our environment to see if it's a place where love flourishes, where people experience love, where they feel belonging. So I guess we could carry it out in a very formal way. We could, you know, use um, a tool, perhaps like a maturity model that we already use for things like inclusion and diversity. But the things we'd look at in that model wouldn't be, for example, whether we have a head of DNI. Uh, whether our policies are written in inclusive language or whether we have lots of employee diversity networks. Instead, we'd be looking for evidence that love is spoken of and experienced in the workplace, that people feel loved, that they feel they belong. And, you know, we could produce a long list of things to check off in our audit. Um, we could, of course, take a less formal approach. So we could use something like design thinking. Um, this is a tool that helps us understand what a problem might be and how we might design solutions for it. So this approach would start by having what are called empathy conversations. Um, these are conversations with people affected by the issue that we're designing for. So in this case, it would be our employees. And we'd sit down and ask them to describe their experience of the workplace in terms of the love and belonging they feel, and sort of take us through that journey of experience and love and belonging in the workplace. Now, of course, it might be that they tell us they've not been experiencing any love at all, and that they feel they don't belong. And so we'd investigate that with them. We'd ask them more about it. We'd understand in greater depth how that makes them feel and what lies behind that. And then after we'd had um, a number of these empathy conversations, we could explore with them what might make a difference for them. And they would start to suggest things. And we could then think about those things further. And if we put together a number of these empathy conversations, we could start to get our creativity sparked. Um, and, and we'd start to get ideas about designing a way to make love a reality in the workplace. So that's two fairly simple descriptions of how you could do a love audit. You could do the formal route with an actual audit, sort of like a checklist, uh, a bit like a maturity model and come up with a score and then create an action plan. Or you could take a more intuitive, perhaps, approach, more bottom up rather than top down, and you could have these empathy conversations. But of course, no one's ever done one of these before. Well, I don't think so. Um, so do get in touch with me. I'd be happy to help design an approach for you and create the world's first ever workplace love audit. Super. Um, what uh, an exciting prospect to end upon. Um, thank you very much, David. Your contributions were full of um, ideas and action points as ever. So thank you.
Thank you so much, Grace, and thank you, everyone. Um, wishing you lots of love uh, in your experience of the workplace, even during these mad times.